Hello and good evening. Welcome back to another episode of Ending Well with Manel. I am Manel Williams. I am the pre-planning funeral director at the New Haven Funeral Center. And I'm really happy to be here with you sharing another great conversation. Um, this one is very close, near and dear to my heart. I don't know if many people know this, but I've also uh, studied to be an end of life doula. So kind of learning about caring for somebody at the ending of their lives. Uh, that's something that I became a little bit more passionate about. And now I am going through the process with. So for me, this conversation is close to home because I'm currently helping to care for my father who is going through the process with Alzheimer's dementia. So as a caregiver, this is something that we have gone over. Oh, I have to confirm, but Nicole and I have gone over together. We have talked about many times. I have phoned with um, <laughs> frustrations. So I'm really happy for us to bring this conversation to you, for you to join the conversation with us as well as we talk about what it is to be a caregiver, how to support each other, and how to care for ourselves as caregivers. So without further ado, let me bring my wonderful guest to the forefront. Hi. <laughs> Round two. Yes. Welcome to Ending Well with Manette. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for um, having me, Manel. This is amazing. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you yeah. for being on. Uh, can you introduce yourself to everyone for me, please? So my name is Nicole McFarlane. I am the founder of Care Concierge. So Care Concierge is a boutique, um, I guess a boutique health support um, agency. So their main focus is to support caregivers and seniors through the aging at home or the aging journey or caregiving journey. Mm -hmm. um, some of the services we do provide mainly is caregiver support and wellness checks for seniors at home. Okay, I love that. Wellness mm -hmm. checks for seniors at home. Yes. Sorry, so that we're, yeah, we're going to really, get into what you do, but I do want to hear about what that is. <laughs> so that really is more focused on, like, you know, there's some seniors who can't get to the doctor. Um, so it's just more of a go-between between, between the senior and their doctor. It is just a check-in, you know, so head-to-toe vitals, psychosocial, how are they, they living, cognitive testing, and then report that off to the doctor. Because for some families, it's quite difficult to get their loved one out, you know, whether it's once a month or so this depends on what the family needs. It could be weekly, it could be once a month, it could be every other month. And then just that go between between myself and the doctor and the family. So they just kind of have a baseline of how the, the patient's doing at home. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Actually, yeah. that leads right into where we're starting oh. the question. So if somebody is noticing, let's, for right now, we'll use the example of perhaps dementia, right? We're noticing that, you know, mom is forgetting some things, we're noticing a few things, and we want to start having the conversation. We don't even know where to start, right? So I know that for some people to try to get a parent assessed, to try to get them to go to a doctor to talk about these things can be really difficult. So I see how that would fill a gap automatically. But yeah. what are the first steps people can do when we start noticing some changes with our parents? I think one of the first steps is to, for yourself, actually acknowledge that these changes are taking place because it, it is really difficult as children, mm -hmm. grandchildren to kind of see the differences. And sometimes the changes are slight yeah. and they're very subtle but in time they become more evident. Mm -hmm. It was actually to acknowledge that, yeah, maybe mom or dad or grandma is not doing things as they once were, mm -hmm. and then actually documenting it. Cause you know, we have a lot of things happening in our heads, right? Yeah. So I think a good place is to always take documentation, um, whether it's in your phone or a little notebook. Mm -hmm. um, so that way you're recording some of the little instances that you have noticed and bring that to the healthcare practitioner, whether it's their doctor or nurse practitioner and say, hey, this is what I'm noticing. But prior to that, it might even be a conversation with your loved one and asking them, have they noticed any differences within mm -hmm. themselves? Usually the answer is no, they're fine. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and that's, and, and that's okay because it's a very scary, um, it's a scary time for them to acknowledge 
that something has changed, mm-hmm. right? Because mm-hmm. all these floods of emotions and feelings come with that, like, oh my God, like I won't, my independence is going to be taken away. I don't want them to know they become like, it's just a, a mixed bag of emotions. So I would say, ask them where they like, you know, if they notice anything. And if the answer is no or yes, the next step is to the um, healthcare practitioner and have that conversation. Then they would be able to guide as to what's next. Yes. I think what you're saying is perfect. I remember one thing I will add is to be open to hear from other people as well. Because a lot of times we see, you know, we've got the, you're perfect goggles, you know, like I don't see anything different. Because I remember people used to tell me, I noticed some changes. And I was like, oh, no, that's just fine. It's travel, you know, just deny, 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 because you don't see it. Yeah. But someone else looking from the outside in might see what we're not seeing. So be yeah. open to that yeah. and not biting their heads off. Yeah. So they don't want to tell us anything else again. Uh, yeah. yeah, be really yeah. Important. And sometimes with that, because we are actually in the situation and living with it all the time, it is our every day. Yeah. It is hard to see what is outside of our, our box, right? Mm-hmm. So sometimes you do need someone who is, who maybe sees that individual once a week, once a month to say like, hey, have you noticed X, Y, and Z? Or when I took mom, Mm -hmm. I noticed something weird. Did you notice that? And it it might prompt to be like, oh, no, I didn't. But you know what? Maybe now I'm going to pay more attention to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect, perfect. Okay, let's talk about Dr. Google. Because (laughs) we know the first thing that we Mm -hmm. do when we get a diagnosis, Mm -hmm. when we start seeing something. So now we've heard from people, okay, I noticed Mm -hmm. something. I'm going to jump on Google and look to see what does this mean? What does this mean for me? So what if we're searching anything, what do we search? And then how do we go to the doctor rather than the Dr. Google? (laughs) So here here is the thing about the lovely world of the internet. I I feel like it is, it's an amazing place to start, Mm -hmm. right? But you can quickly go down this rabbit hole and self-diagnose and work yourself up into a frenzy and and you're just a complete wreck before you even get to see the doctor for them to even tell you something is wrong. Mm -hmm. So I think I usually try to suggest to people to avoid it as much as possible, but I know curiosity kills the cat, right? (laughs) I know that that's like just saying like, okay, go ahead. Like I may as well just tell you to go. So I, I tell them, take that information with a grain of salt. Mm -hmm. right like maybe kind of look at it high level like so dementia what is it and then kind of like okay what do I do next you know just take out maybe some key points from your internet search but don't do the the deep dive of worst case scenario and what happens and all, all because before you even spoke have spoken to your healthcare practitioner it it it, it can actually create a lot of unnecessary stress mm-hmm. um, that one does not need as they're just actually starting this journey. Yes, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. The joys of doing these things online, um, doing our searches and all the little notes, the same notebook, you know, where you're taking track of what yeah. things are happening in mom or dad or mm-hmm. whoever it might be, the same notebook, I had my little Google findings and, yeah. and options and alternatives as well. So <laughs> yeah, what to do, what not to do. Yeah. Well, this worked, that didn't work. You should do this. You got kind of, and then again, your loved one is different. Mm-hmm. You are different. Your yeah. home situation is different. Yeah. So it's, it's not a one size fits all, right? So this is why I say just take what you can from it, little bits of it, and then speak to the professionals to kind of help guide you to the next steps. So we have that. And then online, we're talking about like speaking to professionals, but then I'm just going to jump here. Like also thinking about groups, you know, like I know a lot of people find different Facebook groups. There are a lot of associations. You can go to the association website. There's lots of support there as well. Do you find those to be a a good next step? 100%. Yeah. 100%. Um, I, I think what, a really great thing that came out of COVID were the creation of groups, MS Teams, Zoom, and because people couldn't interact um, in person, this was the next best thing. I love a Facebook group. 
I'm in all kinds of groups. And the thing about the groups, they can be really niche down, right? Mm -hmm. So you can be, your search can be very specific. Um, black caregiver taking care of someone with dementia. Mm -hmm. And then you find your own little community within that group all over the world, mm -hmm. right? And you develop these relationships, yes. these connections, and these people literally show up for you, not in person, but they are there for you virtually, right? So I, I love Facebook groups. I think it's the next best thing to in-person um, groups. But again, you have to take everything with a grain of salt, right? Like not everyone's situation is your situation. Um, it's not a one size fits all, um, but it is a great, absolute great resource um, next to being in person, because I also know some people can't get out in person due to the fact that they're caregivers. Yeah, we're busy. We're busy, right? Yeah. Well, who can go to a group session all the way downtown Toronto for 90 minutes yes. from yeah. seven to nine? Mm -hmm. The next best thing is to jump on online if there's a Zoom mm -hmm. or connect through a Facebook group if there's some sort of live happening. That's another way to stay connected and involved and, and create community and find your community. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. For the Facebook groups, here you go. Facebook club. Prog. <laughs> okay. Do you have one? Do you have a care concierge? Uh, thing? Um, it's something that I actually going to, no, I am going to start because there is value in mm -hmm. talking with others. Yes. Yeah. Right. And here's the other thing with the Facebook group. Sometimes people are not comfortable in sharing with their actual loved ones, like their family members, like who you would consider their support system. They don't want to share. Uh -huh. so it's almost easier to share with someone who you actually don't know and who doesn't know you. Right. And you're kind of living behind the camera off online. Right. Uh -huh. So I think that's why it's an amazing, um, it's an amazing resource. Yes. Or if you're, one who doesn't even know the words to share. Absolutely. Those, because there's always people who are on the group who are willing to talk and share all of their thoughts yeah. and everything. And then it's the same question that you had. They're expressing the same thing that you're feeling. So you get the, like, you get to have the support that yeah. they got just yeah. by reading, you know, and you can yeah. search that at any time yeah. and have that resource, which is also a beautiful thing. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. Here's okay. to the communities. Yeah. Yay, yay. <laughs> Virtual communities. Because I also feel like we're not, to be quite honest, if anything, I have learned um, personally and professionally out of COVID is that we're truly not meant to do life alone, no. right? We are better together. Mm -hmm. um, and groups is another way of doing that. Mm -hmm. Finding your support, finding your community. And that our world isn't as big as we thought, or isn't as small as no, we thought. Exactly. exactly. It, it, it's yeah. beyond us. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Other people who are going through the yeah. exact same thing yeah. and have the exact same worries, and you mm -hmm. can connect and bond on those those feelings. Yeah. yeah. I love it. I love it. And then next thing you know, years down the, down the road, we're having meetups. We're having vacations together. We're doing all of those things. There you go. New family, you know, new connections. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so one thing that I know, and I, I, you, I don't know if you heard me when I was doing my intro, I still have a little, <clears throat> when I say it, but we talk about who identifies as a caregiver, because, mm -hmm. and this is a big one, because I know a yeah. lot of us will think a caregiver means somebody who is at home, taking care of the loved one, doing all the thing, no sleep, changing pampers, everything that is a caregiver, right. but that is not the case. No. So I'll give you the definition okay, from okay. the okay, like A person it. who provides direct care as for children, elderly people, or the chronically ill. Mm -hmm. So you and I recently talked about this. Um, my son, my oldest son, Quadre, he's 23. He is living with autism. Um, it's a spectrum. He is on the, and I don't, I don't like labels, but he is the best way to put it. He is on the higher end of the spectrum. So he is relatively independent, but on the back end, I have to organize a lot of things, mm -hmm. social programming, finances, um, at one point, how to take public transit, I didn't identify as a caregiver, to be quite honest, until recently. Yeah. 
Like I really had to sit with him and be like, wait a minute. I am a caregiver. So a caregiver can look like anything. It can look like the hands on Mm -hmm. day to day care, head to toe of someone. And it could also look like managing someone's affairs on the back end Mm -hmm. um, for the rest of their lives or for a period of time Mm -hmm. um, as they move through uh, illness or, you know, but anybody can be a caregiver. There is no look to a caregiver. And tell me, talk about why is it important for someone to identify that way? Um, because like it, it's a really important job, yeah. right? It's a really important job. And if you don't acknowledge that, it's almost like you're kind of undervaluing yourself a little bit yeah. because to be quite honest, for me professionally, our healthcare system would literally collapse if it wasn't for caregivers Mm. because there are caregivers who don't even access our our services, right? The services that are free to them, Mm -hmm. they privately pay for everything. The only thing they access is the doctor because that's through Mm OHIP, but they don't access home care. They don't access any supports or groups. They privately pay for everything. Now, I think if they didn't have the means and you took that person away, depending on the level of care that the person they're caring for requires, that now becomes a government concern. Like that's something that the government now would have to take in and manage. Well, caregivers literally make our healthcare system evolve and maintain how it is. It's, it's not perfect. But caregivers do have a big role. And I think it's really important for caregivers to acknowledge that they're a caregiver, own it. Yeah. And recognize that they do they're doing a lot of good work and a lot of hard work. That and not everyone can also be a caregiver. <laughs> have the capacity to do that. Yeah. yeah. I think I think you hit the nail on the head right there. Because to call yourself a caregiver means that I'm doing a job. Mm-hmm. And therefore. I can get supports, I can do things, I can reach out. Whereas if not, if I just identify as a spouse or if I just identify as a child, then this is my job. This is what I have to do. Like, it's not something I'm doing for, you know what I mean? Like, it's not that I'm doing something for someone. It's like, now it's just, I just have to keep giving everything that I have until I'm completely depleted. Yeah. Whereas that's not necessarily the case. Right. right. There's so many supports. So can we, okay, on that, let's talk about some of the supports that are available to people. Yeah. Because if you're in that part where you're giving care, but not getting support, what can you take advantage of? Oh, so I mean, the, the big one is home and community care, right? So that's government funded services. Mm-hmm. As an Ontario citizen, you have a health card, you're able to access health, um, home and community care services. So that looks like personal supportive services, so bathing, um, personal care, grooming, um, occupational therapy. So for equipment, physio for mobility, um, dietitian for any nutritional needs, um, social work, mm-hmm. um, physiotherapy, access to long-term care, um, system navigation. So the home and community care really is a big part of a big support to caregivers mm-hmm. um, because they're kind of the hub and there are things that they can connect you and system navigate you to. Day programs, um, support groups, geriatric outreach. Set. Like th- there is so many things that they have access to. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's also like the smaller associations. So like the Heart and Stroke Foundation, the Alzheimer's Society. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you got your community organizations like in... Um, Durham, we have, oh my God, I, they're, my name, they're escaping me, Care Car- Carrera, like they are a community hub mm-hmm. and connect to family health teams, um, any services or programs in Durham. So each area has like their own kind of resources, but like home and community care is kind of the hub of that and connecting to those services within your local area. Okay. <laughs> the list is great. Like, first of all, there's so much support out there. Mm-hmm. 
I feel like it's like grants, you know, where there's just so much money available, but people don't know how to access it. Yes. So I hear your list and me thinking about myself a couple of years ago, I, I can feel it. I can feel it coming up in me. So many people, so many people to contact. Where do I even, yeah. we talk about the first call. Okay. We call the doctor. Yeah. How do we get connected to the branch right. for, for the Google search? So it depends on what it is, right? So if we're talking... Alzheimer's. So you see the doctor, you recognize there's a concern. The doctor will say, you know what, we're going to do a referral to the um, geriatric um, assessments, you know, so they will do an assessment. You know, it's usually a couple of hours in length and then come up with a diagnosis. And then from there, they will explain to you as well what services are available in the community. So whether it's home and community care, privately funded services, public funded services, support groups. Um, so it just depends on kind of what it is. Like, so if you're even like, I've had patients who are living with chronic kidney disease. So there's the kidney um, foundation, right? And they have their own resources and support. So it just really, I think there's, supports for every diagnosis out there. You just have to find it. But typically the best place to start is your doctor. Mm -hmm. Having that diagnosis is really, really important because then you kind of know which way to go, right? You know how to now do the Google search because now you know kind of specifically what you're looking for as opposed to thinking this is what it is, which leads you down this this windy road as opposed to, I know this is what it is. This is what the diagnosis is. So here is the chain of command. Like here is the, the next steps that I should follow. Okay. Okay. I like that. I also, I want to acknowledge that like I'm, t I'm using, I started off with my example. So we're yeah. talking about seniors care, but there's care. Uh, there's a whole spectrum of people mm -hmm. who need care. As you're saying, your son is a younger person. Mm -hmm. right? so there can be care for a longer period of time. There can be care for shorter periods of time. Mm -hmm. We talk to insurance people about critical illness, disability, all those kind of things to help somebody in any age at any time mm -hmm. or for any amount of time that mm -hmm. they require care. There's always support. It's just a matter always. of reaching out to try to find out. Reaching so, out, finding out, mm -hmm. and also willing to accept yeah. The support too. Mm -hmm. That's a big one, especially for our community. Yes. Um, that is a big one is to be willing to accept the help. Talk about it. Talk yeah. about it. <laughs> challenging. Um, our community, it's really challenging, but I think it's it's challenging for I, I a lot of couples that I have, you know, sometimes the spouse doesn't want to kind of let go of that control. So they know like there's complaining to you that they're burnt out. And I'm saying, well, here are a list of services that you can access. Here's what we can provide as care concierge. And it's like, well, no, I'm fine. Yeah. And it's like, no, you're not fine. So it's, it's almost kind of, you have to figure out where to meet people where they are. So you don't want to apply too much pressure, but I do believe knowledge is power. So you literally want to say, well, here's the information go off and digest it. Yeah. yeah. You know, let me know what you think, where you're at. Um, do you need me to come with you to check this out? Because maybe it just might be simple as, you know, that, that actual physical support of, hey, there's a stay program or, you know, there's this private group I'm not sure about. I don't want to go alone. Mm -hmm. Do you mind coming? Absolutely. And then it's like, okay, we've checked one thing off the list. Mm -hmm. So now we're inching a little bit closer, you know, yeah. to, the, to the, the goal that we want, which is to alleviate some of that burnout. I, I, I want to under, understand and I want to provide support especially for our seniors especially for black seniors or any really a lot of like the mental health support is something that i think is lacking for seniors because mm -hmm. it's this saying you know like i'm fine i'm fine i don't need your help i'm fine i'm going to internalize everything that i'm feeling and i'm just going to keep pushing whereas if i was able to talk to you about the fact that you don't have to carry this weight mm -hmm. maybe you'd be more likely to actually accept services but I, I like, I'm not gonna have to do more research into finding out if there are specific services that provide mental health support for seniors, right? Like that's something that. Well, it does exist, but if we're gonna niche it down for for us, 
I have yet. If you find it, let me know, please. Oh, if you're out there and you're watching this and you know of anybody that yeah. does, please share it with yeah. us. Yeah. Please so share it with us. I think that us. is really important. Yeah. Um, I think a good place for us to start with our seniors is for the caregivers or the person providing care to look like them. Mm -hmm. There's a certain comfort level. I, I think that goes with anybody, anyone who isn't born here, you know, like, you know, they come from Italy, um, you know, China. I think there is a comfort level in having someone who is providing the care that looks like you, that speaks your language, even possibly culturally. There is that comfort level. Is it a realistic option to expect that, especially when you're accessing government funded services? No, right? You, you can look to privately pay for that. But I think that's a good place to start is to say, okay, you know, maybe the caregiver or the person providing that hands-on care to mom, if they can just understand a little bit about her background. Yeah. Because that might make her comfortable, right? And you can ask for that. A lot of people feel uncomfortable asking for it, but ask for the care that you need, right? If whether it's provided or not, we'll see. Yeah, and sometimes, to be quite honest, I also feel very strongly that good care is good care, no matter yeah. what culture, race. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes it is just having that conversation with the supports that are coming into the home, just giving them a little bit of a background about the person that they're caring for so that they, they can have a deeper understanding of, who they're seeing mm -hmm. and then how they can kind of cultivate their care plan to best meet the needs of the person that they're caring for. Yeah. yeah. Oh, can we just for a second yes. talk about um, how difficult, and you, you provide these services, so thank you, uh, how difficult it is to have consistent people. Because I know if we're accessing government um, provided services, yeah. then you can't have, you. Most no, likely, no. you're not going to have the same person coming. Yeah. If you're looking for private services, then maybe you can. Absolutely. Especially when we're talking about seniors, especially, well, not even seniors, anybody. If somebody's coming in, oh, I'm so sorry. If somebody is coming in, you know, to to change my my bedpan, I would be, I would hope, if it's at all possible, <laughs> it would be the same person. So, you know, them and I, we can start to yeah. get a little bit familiar rather than constantly having yeah. a new person. So what are some things, maybe you know, like some things that we can do if it's different people coming that can kind of break down that barrier and help us feel a little bit more comfortable with somebody new entering our space yet again? So I think it's really important if there is a um, government funded provider coming, it would be seeing if it's possible, depending on the level of support to have maybe a pool of people mm -hmm. coming in and providing the care. Okay. Right. So if it's a high number of personal supportive hours, the ask could be, hey, like out of these hours, you know, maybe can we have three people um, come in so that way you get used to them. The yeah. person that's receiving the care gets used to them. They get used to the household and everybody um, and then everyone's comfortable. Right. Um, the next thing is to review the care plan um, with everyone that comes into the home. So the needs, how to do things, have it documented. Um, so that way, literally, if there is a new person that comes into home to provide care, they read the care plan. They should basically have it. They should know based on that care plan what their responsibilities are. Yes. <laughs> I have a question. Can you please explain what a care plan is? A care plan basically acknowledges the care of the patient, like what needs to be done. So whether it's, you know, bathing, dressing, it acknowledges the type of mobility. Do they require mobility aids? Do they need a hearing aid? Um, do they have issues with their vision? How to demonstrate, how to um, like execute the care? What are you doing? Mm -hmm. You know, so we're here for personal care. Okay, in that, what does that look like? Mm -hmm. Bathing, grooming, shaving, mm -hmm. hair washing. So it literally breaks down the care that this person needs. So anyone new, so it's no different than as a, a nurse working in the hospital, I get report. Yeah. I get report for a patient that I haven't seen before. Mm -hmm. The nurse tells me that, you know, this is, there was their, their during their shift, this was the report. I walk off and now read the care plan. Okay. 
you know, I read the care plan so I get there, I know their diagnosis, mm -hmm. age, who the doctor is on call. Okay, this is what this person requires. Okay, they've improved. Here are the goals of care, mm -hmm. right? So maybe we're doing, you know, walking daily with assistance. The goal is for them to be able to mobilize independently. Okay. So, okay, I'm going to, a part of my role is to execute that. So maybe on my shift, I'm going to get them out of bed and walk with them okay. for, you know, 10, 15 minutes. Yeah. Okay. Can the care plan also include the personal items? Like they like to be spoken to this way. They Absolutely. like to be touched here or not. They like this stuff. You're going to put on, a spell, put on this music, put on this. Absolutely. 100%. Yeah. yeah. The care plan is essentially your insight to that person. Mm -hmm. their care needs and also their care goals and the care plan can change yes. to be quite honest a care plan should actually be reviewed um every few months mm -hmm. if the person is stable yes but if there is a change in medical status it should be reviewed after that so someone goes into hospital they are you know congestive heart failure they're discharged home, the care plan should be reviewed um, and changed to reflect that who they are today. Because the care plan three months ago may not be reflective of their needs today. They may be worse, they may be better. So it does need to be adjusted. Okay, okay. I think that's a, that's a huge, <laughs> I, I, all I'm thinking of myself right now is, I need a care plan for me right now. If I should- And, and we do it. it. We do it for ourselves. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Well, I'm going to the gym. I'm going to lose, my goal is to lose 15 pounds. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, I lost 15 pounds. Well, now I want to lose 20. <laughs> yeah, okay. What do I got to do? Yeah. What do I got to eat? Like we yeah. do it on our day to day for ourselves, but we don't call it a care plan. Yes. Right? We do it every day. Like how yeah. we are going to navigate yeah. this project, how we're going to execute this. We do it. We come up with our plan and here's a little checklist and here's how we're going to do it and what's the goal. And we yes. meet that. Okay. We change the care plan or this yes. could work. Okay. Let me do something else. We do it every day. We just yes. don't call it a care plan. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's easy <laughs> to create. <laughs> Caregivers, this is our homework for tonight. Real quick one, just a real quick voice note that I have I'm a huge fan of voice to text, everything. Google Doc, voice to text, do it while you drive, just talk to it. You can edit it later, but at least it's written down. This is true. This is then having the. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it easier. Yeah. yeah. People have to figure out what works for them, right? Yeah. Yeah. There are people who like the, And I think if you have care coming into your home, you yeah. should have a notebook. You should have a centralized binder, yeah. medication list. Mm -hmm. Their care plan, mm -hmm. contact information, allergies, all those things should be centralized for anyone coming into the home. They should be able to access that. But for your own personal self, yes, your medic, the person's medication list should be in your phone. Um, hopefully you don't lose your phone, yeah. right? <laughs> um, but you can, yeah, have, do whatever works for you. And if it's, if you are up with technology, use it. If pen to paper works for you, so write it down. <laughs> okay okay this was good that's my little tip for me um, <laughs> let's talk about having preemptive conversations with our families okay so now nobody's sick you know we're blessed everybody is healthy we're here right now but life can life in a minute so having these conversations now and i mean now yeah. is imperative so talking to our family about in home care versus going into a home. So I, for me, what I'm thinking when I'm having these conversations with my family, like what would you prefer? But what are also the implications when it comes to us at home? Because mm -hmm. I know I was talking to one of my girlfriends about this and having the loved one in the house and passing in the house created a lot of strain on that place that should be the sanctuary. Absolutely. But their wish was to be at home, but you're not thinking about how it affects everybody else. So how do we navigate that kind of conversation? And those are a, such a great question. Advanced mm -hmm. care planning mm -hmm. is essential. Mm -hmm. You know, so that consists of 
power of attorney. Like, who do you want to make your decision when, when or if you cannot? Yes. Right? What are your wishes? Do you trust this person to execute your wishes? Mm-hmm. Uh, what, how do you want to, you know, if you have a stroke and you're no longer to, is that okay for you? At what point do you want your family to consider long-term care? Mm-hmm. Right? Would that be an option? It, it is very important to have these conversations when you don't have the stress, when you're not in a reactive mode. Yes. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. And it's hard for everyone to have these conversations because you're, you're literally planning for worst case scenario. Yeah. But it's realistic, right? That is the world we live in. Mm-hmm. Anything can change in one second. Your entire world, as you know it, can change tomorrow. We just went through that as a society. As a we woman. did. We yeah. did. And I think it's imperative to have these conversations when you're not under stress. Mm-hmm. Um, and sometimes you will need to have these conversations more than once. Because mm-hmm. not everyone is receptive to these conversations. Yeah. So you might have to start in small doses mm-hmm. and work your way up to um, the end goal of understanding what this person wishes would be if they can no longer care for themselves or if they can no longer speak for themselves, mm-hmm. what what would they want to have happen? And you hope that these things are documented. So whether it's, you know, your power of attorney and have that actually living document, yes. um, meeting with a lawyer to understand, you know, the finances, mm-hmm. right? Because you have, if you own a home, if you have stocks, you have bonds, you have liquid cash, whatever that looks like, how do you navigate that? Yes. Like I know from my son recently, um, two weeks ago, I went to a basically an estate planning session. Mm-hmm. And I was blown away yes. because there are things that I really did not even consider mm-hmm. in regards to his future if mm-hmm. I'm not there. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. Who am I going to put in charge to help him mm-hmm. navigate this world mm-hmm. if I'm not here? Mm-hmm. His brother's too young. Yeah. His sister, she's there, but she also has her own children, right? Yeah. So it's trying to figure out, gosh, like how do I navigate this space, make these decisions while I can uh-huh. in his best interest? Uh-huh. I think the worst thing for a lot of my families is when they wait until something happens. Yeah. And so you're dealing with the stressor of the situation. And then on top of it, now they got to make these big, hard decisions. Yes. Yeah. Filled with so much emotion and pain and they don't know what to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Running to lawyers, trying to get paperwork signed with days, you know, the, the amount of stress that can be put on somebody at that time. Yeah. Yeah. So I really encourage people to have it beforehand. Have ask your parents, hey, do you have a power of attorney? Like who is it? Uh-huh. Do you have a will? Do you have life insurance? Dad, what would you want? Like, you know, if you are not able to make decisions, what do you want? Like, do you want to go to a nursing home? Yeah. Do you want to stay at home? And what does that look like? Do we have financial means? to provide care for you at home. Because it's not cheap. Because it's not cheap. Nothing's cheap, yeah. <laughs> cheap. Yeah. yeah. And the reality of it is people have to really um, look to combining government funded services and accessing those supports, but also privately paying for something. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's just what it is. It is what it is. Yeah. You know, you. that's just how in order to kind of take care of someone at home, it needs to be a combination of things. Mm-hmm. Okay. I love your passion. I love <laughs> <laughs> so you're just about, Cause that, I'm like, we're at the end. We were just going over who is care concierge. Right. How can you help people? And right. I ended, it just cut. Okay. So it, it just really depends. So typically my typical um, client looks like someone that I journey with anywhere from maybe 60 to 90 days. Um, It can look like, you know, maybe 
someone coming home, their loved one coming home from the hospital, and they just kind of need that little bit of support at home just to kind of organize everything. So they had, and so let me start. I service Durham region and Durham mm -hmm. region only um, for now. Yeah. <laughs> um, so Pickering East Ajax would be Oshawa, Curtis, Bowmanville, Newcastle, all of that. Mm -hmm. um, Newtonville. Um, I know, right? I know. <laughs> I know, little, small, little town. Yeah, um, anyways, um, so, you know, you have a loved one. Maybe they were, went into hospital. They had an extended hospital stay. Now they're coming home. You went through the whole discharge plan. They're coming home and, you know, they're coming home to mom and that's it. Mm -hmm. And mom is completely freaked out yeah. about how she is going to manage their care all the services coming in so we can come in and kind of put in a nice little package. Okay. Like okay. really map out what's going to happen on a day-to-day -day basis, create that folder of contact information, community supports that are coming in, who you need to contact. If you have any questions, pharmacy, we can pick up the medication. We can help that person get settled in to their home, you know, because when it's coming home, especially if you had an extended hospital stay, it can be frightening. Yeah, yeah. Right? Even in hospital for like three weeks or beyond, mm -hmm. that's become your new normal. So now you're coming home. This is a new normal again, because now you're coming home and maybe your mobility is different. Uh, maybe you're no longer residing on the upstairs. Now you're on the main floor. Um, your, kid, your spouse or children are anxious. Mm -hmm. because now they don't know what to do. So we come in and just kind of package it all up, easy anxieties, help them just kind of settle into this new normal. Yeah. And just like the anxiety is normal and just reassure them that this is normal. But as things go on, as the days and weeks go on, it's going to disappear. Mm -hmm. And you're going to um, establish a routine. So the job for us is not to be in there forever is to just really short term and then get out. And we're always there if they need to access. Um, and it's also help, we also help with those advanced planning conversations, how mm -hmm. to start. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of the questions they get, like, you know, my mom is not really receptive to, um, you know, discussing a power of attorney. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you mention it, she thinks like, we're yeah. going to die and it's just like, so it is meeting that person where they're at. Mm -hmm. and what do they understand about advanced care planning? And sometimes it's really just taking away all those big words mm -hmm. and really saying, hey, we just want to plan for the time when you may not be able to take care of yourself. If that happens, that may never happen. And if mm -hmm. that never happens, we are good. Yes. That's it. That's yeah. actually what we want. Yeah. We don't want that to happen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's say it does. Mm -hmm. What do you want this to look like? Like, we, I want, you know, the whole, usually the conversation is, I want you to be able to participate in your care before you actually need the care. There you go. There you go. I want you mm -hmm. to advocate for yourself now because you can. Mm -hmm. And let's talk about what your wishes are. Let's mm -hmm. dispel some myths. Mm -hmm. You know, let's Talk about the anxieties or the concerns you may have. Um, let's lay it all out on the table, have open, honest conversations. Sometimes those conversations are also in private. So maybe I may talk with the, the care recipient and, you know, be their support in talking to the caregiver. Yeah. You know, kind of that bridge. You know, so a lot of the work yeah. we do is more um, supportive. Mm hmm if anything, mm -hmm. is yeah. to support them through this journey. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Tonight. I will be, of course, chopping this up and putting it on all <laughs> the table, so you'll be able to get it all throughout. Uh, next week, I have um, Lorianne. Sorry, I had a moment. I have Lorianne. We'll be talking about transferring estates, kind of what you were talking about, learning about trusts and transferring your estates yeah. to your loved ones with a tax professional because it is the season. It is right. the season. <laughs> thank you. Have a good night. Right. Bye now. Thank you. Have a good night.
Mm-hmm.